So let's get started. Um, I'm very pleased to be opening the second uh, meeting, the second lecture in our second uh, Floss lecture series on the birth of a new theology, of a new philosophy from the crucible of uh, theology. Patristic metaphysics is the, uh, is the general title of this uh, series of lectures. We had a wonderful kickoff uh, with a lively discussion um, uh, last month with Johannes Zahuber. And uh, now we pass from the uh, experienced Oxford professor to the very young, uh, talented promise, Giovanni Mandolino, who uh, is my great pleasure and honor to, to, to host today. Um, Giovanni earned his uh, MA at the University of Pisa and at the prestigious Scuola Normale Superiore in the same city. He got a doctorate in 2020 from the University of Padua under the guidance of Cecilia Martini. And at the University of Padua, he is currently postdoc researcher with a project on John Philoponus and Christian and Islamic philosophy of the 10th and 11th centuries. Despite his young academic age, Giovanni has an impressive track record of publications. I should like to recall his commented translation of John Scotus Eugenius homily and commentary on the Gospel of John for Brepols's Corpus Christianorum in translation series, and his critical edition of Eugenius Carmen de Imagine as part of a volume of the Corpus Christianorum series Latina, Continuatio Medievalis. Giovanni's interests range from Greek patristics, with an insightful article he published on Gregory of Nyssus, the Hominis Opificio, through Eugenia to Christian and Islamic Arabic falsafa, to which he consecrated his doctoral dissertation on Yahya ibn Addis on the unity of God. This dissertation will be published in 2023 by Brill Publishers, where it has been accepted for publication already. And most recently, he edited a highly interesting commented uh, source volume on the doctrine of the analogy of being for the Paduan publisher Il Polygrafo. And he addressed his research interests towards John Philoponus's understudied theological production. And in order to do this, he also added Syriac after Greek, Latin, and Arabic to his wide intellectual uh, dossier. Today, then, we are pleased to have him talk on the latter topic, on John Philoponus, with a paper on actual riots and ontological revolutions, remarks on John Philoponus's theological thought. Giovanni, thank you for being here. and. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, uh, thanks to the organizers of the Floss Lectures for inviting me. Um, I will start by apologizing for my English pronunciation. Of course, if something is not clear, don't hesitate to stop me. Um, so, uh, the aim of this seminar is to provide some uh, Further background, uh, some additional background to what we know about the theological thought of sixth century philosophy and Christian theologian John Philoponus. While the discovery of Philoponus' contribution to late antique philosophy is due especially to the research of Richard Sraji, Philoponus' theological profile has been recently investigated, especially by Johannes Zach Huber within the broader framework of his research on what he chose to label patristic philosophy. Zachubert, building on the views of Eastern Orthodox theologians such as Vladimir Losky, John Zizulas, and on the views of the philosopher Theo Kobush, thinks that the late antique patristic thought caused an ontological evolution, which meant the end of ancient metaphysics and the beginning of a new ontological perspective focused no longer on the general and abstract notion of substance, but on the notions of concretely existing personhood and individuality. Whereas previous versions of this reconstruction maintained that the crucial shift took place within, during the Trinitarian debates of the fourth century, Zakubert thinks that it should be moved to the Christological debates following the Council of Chalcedon, so um, between the fifth and the sixth centuries. Now, 
John Philoponus is known to the historians of, of philosophy, especially as the disciple of the pagan Neoplatonic philosopher Ammonius, specialized in Aristotelian commentaries, several of which transcribed and transmitted under the name of Philoponus himself. And he is known also as the author of philosophical refutations on, of the eternity of the world as maintained by Aristotle and by the pagan Athenian Neoplatonist Oculus. However, at the same time, Philoponus is among the opponents of the Christology established at Chalcedon. He is one of the so-called Nephysites or Monophysites, notably led by his older contemporary Severus Bishop of Antioch. Um, now I will share with you my, uh, my slides, uh, which I was forgetting to do, but I was just getting started. So you are you aren't missing anything. Um, so um, sorry, I will do that again. Uh, do you see the PowerPoint? No. no, we actually see your folder. My folder, okay. Once more. Before we have seen the, the PowerPoint. Yes, we could see it before. Uh, this time. Okay. Um, here it was. So, Philoponus plays a key role in Zakuba's reconstruction of the patristic ontological revolution. According to Zakuba, Philoponus' contribution consists in clearly developing the idea that substance or nature can be taken to mean not only, as was customary in patristic theology, a common or universal substance shared by several individuals or hypostases, but that it can also refer to particular existence belonging exclusively to one individual. On the one hand, this new understanding of nature or substance represents Philoponus' own solution to the central theoretical problem debated in Christology. That is, how could the divinity as a whole, that is the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, save humanity as a whole, despite the belief that only the Trinitarian hypostasis of the Son became incarnate in only one human individual? that is Jesus. In theoretical terms, how can the union of two common substances, the divine and human, be reconciled with the belief that only one individual taken from each nature was involved in the union? Philoponus' answer is that each individual has its own particularized share of the common nature. Therefore, a union of individuals is at the same time necessarily also a union of natures. On the other hand, however, Philoponus solution has often been seen by ancient heresiographers and modern scholars as fatally entailing a division of the one divine substance, and therefore to pave the way for Philoponus subsequent Trinitarian heresy, that is, Trinitarianism. Now, Uh, let's start with some key texts, um, um, a foreword to these key texts. Philoponus' theology is, usu is usually seen as a consequence of his ontology. Philoponus' ontological position has been described as particularism, for instance, by scholars such as Christopher Isman, namely as the view that all that exists are particular things, meaning concrete individuals such as Peter and Paul, and that universals, such as men, are nothing but concepts abstracted by the human mind. While on the one hand, this does allow Philoponus to build a Christology grounded in the notion of individuality, on the other hand, this would inevitably lead him to traitorism. Therefore, Philoponus' theology is usually conceived as flawed by his ontology. 
especially by his star of Aristotelianism. The classical counterpoint is the fragment of his lost treatise on Trinity, quoting Aristotle's statement in the Anima, that is, the universal is either nothing or posterior. Today, I do not wish to challenge the idea that Philoponus maintained the view labeled as particularism. However, I do wish to add some background to the current picture. The main extant work where Philoponus develops his views on substance or nature and hypostasis or individual is his main Christological treatise, The Arbiter, written shortly before the Fifth Ecumenical Council of 553. It is integrally extant in CX translation plus several fragments in the original Greek. Uh, the key passages outlining Philoponus' ontological views and examined by scholars are luckily extant in Greek, and they are found especially in chapters 4 and 7 of the Arbiter. So these are the, the main uh, texts, the key texts by Philoponus invoked by scholars. Text 1. For the common and universal intelligible content in Greek logos of human nature, Albeit it is in itself one, but when realized in many subjects, becomes many, existing in each completely and not partially, as the intelligible content of a ship in a shipbuilder being one becomes many when it is realized in many subjects. Thus, also the doctrine in a teacher being one in its intelligible content, when it is realized in those who are taught, is multiplied in them by becoming inherent as a whole in each one. Moreover, the pattern on a ring being one, when it is realized as a whole in each of many impressions, both is then and may be said to be many, so that the many ships and the many men and the many impressions and the doctrines and the many pupils qua individuals are numerically many, and in this respect they are divided and not united. Qua common species, however, the many men are one and the many ships are one and the doctrines likewise, and the impressions by the sameness of the pattern are one. Hence, in one respect, they are many and divided, in another respect, united and one. Uh, please be patient, let me read also text two, which is shorter. Uh, Therefore, each nature is called what it is, not in a single, but in a twofold manner. In one way, when we look at the common intelligible content, logon, of each nature on its own, such as the nature of man or of horse, which does not exist in any of the individuals. In another way, when we look at the same common nature, which comes to be in the individuals and assumes a most particular existence in each of them and does not fit with anything else except with this alone. So uh, these texts are usually taken to mean that the common nature undergoes a division when particularized in several individuals. Now, I am not so sure that this is the implication. First, Philoponus openly says that each logos of the being of a given nature comes to be as a whole and not partially in its many subjects. Text one. Second, he avoids all reference to the notion of division in his treatment of the idea that we usually label particular nature. Instead, he repeatedly employs idiom, pauper, and related terms when referring to the way that the logos became incarnate, whereas he only employs mei cotate hypaxis, most particular existence, to refer to the human individual assumed by the logos. Examples where the original gate can be checked are found throughout chapter 7, from which text 2 is taken. So the latter terminological differentiation probably means that Philoponus carefully avoided the implication of division of the Godhead in, in his notion of particular nature, and that he was not that doomed to die a treatise. Finally, one may ask, what is the point of introducing particular natures severed from the common nature if the aim of such an innovation was precisely to provide the missing link between common nature and individual? Therefore, the notion of particular 
semantically entailing division and expressed with a form of that adjective makos has a very specific use in philoponous ontology. At the same time, however, it has an important and interesting philosophical counterpart, which I now hope to show. This is a text from Philoponus Commentary on Physics, and from, uh, taken from the uh, initial pages of his commentary. Uh, Philoponus here asks why Aristotle in the initial chapter of the physics appears to identify the universals in Greek katholu and the things that are prior for us, from which the natural investigation, according to Aristotle, should start. As an answer, the commentary explicitly maintains the possibility of understanding the term universal katholu found in Aristotle's text as actually referring to the indeterminate particular to something which is melkon and which is uh, described as being aoriston indeterminate. In turn, the indeterminate particular is contrasted to the determinate individual, katrekasta, which is instead horismenon, that is a, a determinate defined. A difference, says Philoponus, made by Aristotle in his De Interpretatione. However, interestingly, although one may recognize the reference to chapter seven of the De Interpretatione, the distinction as such is not found there. Indeed, in that passage, Aristotle distinguishes between Catholu and Catechasta, that is between universals and individuals, but there is no threefold distinction and there is no Macon, no particular. Philoponus commentary then defines the particular as nothing but an indeterminate individual capable of application to many things. Therefore, the term universal is here interpreted as individual, namely as the individual qua indeterminate. Now, text four, uh, a little below, Philoponus provides an example. The example of the progressive knowledge starting from the indeterminate individuals consists in saying that someone approaching from afar is a certain animal, Tizon, or a certain man, Tisantopos, without, however, specifying neither what kind of animal, a man, a horse, nor which individual man, Plato, Alcibiades. As the indeterminate individual approaches, its identity becomes progressively clearer until it is close enough for us to discern its individuating properties and determine who he or she is. So the progression goes from a certain animal to a certain man to Socrates, for instance. The threefold distinction of universal particular individual in this place appears original. The earlier commentary on physics by Themistius, while anticipating other aspects of Philoponus' commentary, does not provide the key item, namely the reduction of Aristotle's other reference to universal, to the notion of indeterminate individual. Now, if we follow Philoponus' reference, Philoponus' cross reference to the De Interpretazione proves interesting. Commentaries on the interpretation in the tradition of Ammonius, take chapter seven or the end of chapter six of the interpretation to introduce different kinds of propositions. They distinguish between particular and universal uh, subjects of the proposition, namely Socrates versus man. The latter uh, kind of proposition, universal proposition, can be without or with an additional qualification in Greek called posdeismos. And this additional qualification can in turn be particular or universal. For instance, one man versus every man. This is relevant because it provides the antecedent for categorizing the indeterminate individual as an instance of universal predication, precisely as a universal premise with a particular posdeismos. The example, one man in the commentaries, which is uh, one of the two uh, circled uh, examples here. Osai Santopos, actually, the, um, this is a, a translation by the modern editor of a Syriac commentary by Probus. So uh, the Syriac has a, a word meaning race as a number too, but 
the Greek commentaries in the tradition of Ammonius have this anthropos. So this is even closer to our uh, uh, key terms. Um, so the, the point I wish to stress here is that there are universal propositions that uh, ancient commentaries on Aristotle did uh, subsume propositions having the subject uh, one man as under universal propositions. And Ammonius and another anonymous commentary published by Leonardo Tan even specified that the distinction between individual and particular propositions goes back to Theophastus, Aristotle's successor as a guide of the Lyceum. Therefore, from the commentary tradition, the conclusion may easily be derived that the very notion of universal subsumes under itself the notion of indeterminate individual. Hence, Philoponus may have produced his contribution to the evolution while thinking he was doing the most natural, indeed conventional thing in the world, and that he could trace his idea back to Theophastus. Now, at present, I am not able to determine uh, whether an exact relationship exists between this doctrinal complex, which was illustrated here through Philoponus commentary on physics and through the commentaries on the interpretazione, uh, and uh, late patristic theology. However, I believe that the question is worth of closer investigation. Right now, I am not able to provide either a systematic picture or a rational starting point for such an investigation, but please allow me to provide one example taken from the Syriac tradition. The three relevant concepts appear again in the theological thought of the East Syriac author Babai the Great, died the 628 Christian era. Babai distinguishes between a common substance or nature, usilia, its existence as a numerically divided hypostasis, and its individualization as a person, possible, possessing a unique set of properties. In addition to this, Babai echoes the example of the approaching individual in his Liber de Union, text 6. So if one adds to this that the introduction of Babai's commentary on Evagrius Kefala Agnostica produces the same traditional introductory Kefalaya found in the late antique school commentaries, especially on Aristotle, the curiosity of investigating the possible links between this East, East Syriac thinker and the philosophical tradition in cases, in my eyes at least. Now, um, another aspect of Philoponus' particularism that deserves closer inspection, it seems to me, is its relationship with Philoponus' belief in the existence of creative rational principles, the Mugikoi Logoi, to be found in the mind of God and consisting in God's thoughts, noises. This is an idea which is short yet unequivocally stated in several passages of Philoponus' work against Proclus. Chapter 4 of the Arbiter, uh, seen above, and text 1 here, uh, you can see it again, contains examples clearly traceable to this doctrine, which has a long pedigree in Christian reflection on creation, studied among others by Salvatore Lilla, for instance. The shipbuilder's concept of ship being multiplied in the many ships that are actually built points to the idea of a demiurgic mind. And in Against Proclus, the mention of the demiurgicore logoi is illustrated in one instance by the same example. Um, Yes, this, this is um, the passage from against Proclus containing the same example and the reference to the logo in the divine mind. At the same time, another example in the Arbiter, the teacher's theorem being multiplied in the minds of his disciples points to a similar idea, perhaps with the implication that the divine mind is also the principle of knowledge for the other minds. 
At the same time, it recalls Philoponus' philosophical interpretation of the active intellect as the intellect of the teacher, leading from potentiality to actuality, the intellects of his disciples. Both examples, the shipbuilder and the teacher, point to the idea of an incorporeal mental entity realized in several subjects. The third and last example also points in this direction. Indeed, the comparison of the rings men in passions, initially employed by Plato and Aristotle and later picked up by Plotinus in a Neoplatonic framework, clearly calls harmonious theory of the three states of the universal, illustrated by the same example in his commentary on Zagordio. A theory of the three states of the universal assumes a fundamental agreement between the views of Plato and Aristotle, thus allowing for the existence of paradigmatic forms before the many, located in the divine demiurgic mind and investigated by the theologian. Ammonius also calls these uh, uh, forms in the divine mind logoi ones. Then, according to Ammonius, we have forms in the many, which are immanent in the individuals and investigated by the natural philosopher. And finally, forms after the many, abstracted by the human mind and investigated by the logician or the dialectician. And the forms before the many are compared to the seal of a ring, repeatedly impressed on several pieces of wax and subsequently recognized by the observers as impressions originating from the same model. So we have, uh, I think we do have a subtext in the Arbiter chapter four, which reminds us of the ammonium theory of the three states. Now, I believe that Philoponus particularism is, is not necessarily contradicted by the admission of the existence of paradigmatic entities in God's mind. A passage from Philoponus' commentary on Aristotle's De Generazione et Corruzione is remarkable. And here it is. Text 8. Uh, it is remarkable because it pairs the rejection of self-subsisting -subs universals with the affirmation of their subsistence only in the demiurgic or logo. So this, these are the two uh, sentences that are highlighted here in the slide. So, however, I believe we should not mistake Philoponus, the Mugikoi, Logoi, and Noesis for Platonic forms. Indeed, Philoponus sharply contrasts the Platonic notion of forms, which are separate substances, and his own notion of creative Logoi and Noesis in God, a contraposition also found in Philoponus' physics commentary. To my knowledge, we have no straightforward statement by Philoponus substantiating the difference he clearly sees between the Platonic forms and the Logoi. However, in Against Proclus and in his commentary on Genesis called the Opificio Mundi, Philoponus does state with all the desirable clarity that God has foreknowledge of individual things. From this, it appears likely that the Demugicoi Logoi according to Philoponus, are the essential principles of the individuals, not universal forms serving each as a general paradigm of all the individuals at once. Um, so uh, in order to get a better picture, uh, one should compare carefully Philoponus and Ammonius uh, ontology and in particular, perhaps uh, compare Philoponus ideas with the Ammonius commentary on the interpretation of chapter nine, where Ammonius discusses divine foreknowledge, because Aristotle in that chapter speaks of the truth or, or of its applicability to the future contingents. So, to sum up, Philoponus Arbiter seems to present us with a view of universals which entails a causal priority of essential principles over the many forms. Since such a model rests on the distinctive Neoplatonic conception of the superior principles, which remain unaffected despite being realized in their many participants, we should think that it does not entail the division of the one common logos of a given thing when it becomes realized in many subjects. 
On the contrary, it appears to entail its indivisibility despite its being participated by many subjects. The examples in chapter four of the Arbiter appear to confirm this. After all, the one ring is not broken into pieces by impressing its seal several times, and a fortiori the knowledge in the mind of the shipbuilder and of the teacher being incorporeal is not fractioned, is not divided because of its outward realization in several subjects. So this is uh, uh, the, the main body of my seminar. I will now add only one uh, small part uh, very quickly um, concerning uh, um, a methodological assumption. Uh, you know that, um, as I said before, so Philoponus and Ammonius ontologies appear quite close to each other, at least as far as the three states of the universals are concerned. However, in Ammonius theory, this, the idea of the three states of the universal before the many, in the many, and after the many goes hand in hand with a methodological and, so to say, historiographic assumption, uh, which is the agreement of uh, Plato and Aristotle on the main uh, doctrines in their main theories. Now, Philoponus does not accept this assumption. This is a first important element to take into account for a future comparison of the ontologies. Philoponus, despite being a disciple of Ammonius, refuses, rejects uh, the idea that Plato and Aristotle agree with each other, especially on the issue of the existence of separate forms. While Ammonius would have us believe that uh, the or that Plato and Aristotle only differ in, in focus, not on the very solution that they offer, that they provide. Philoponus knows that this is a lie and states it very clearly in his Against Proclus. Um, it is a matter of debate for historians of late antique philosophy why Neoplatonic philosophy developed the theory of the agreement of Plato and Aristotle. The favored hypothesis is that it did so due to the pressure exerted by Christian accusations of inconsistency addressed to pagan wisdom overall. As a response, pagan Neoplatonic philosophers closed ranks, so to say, by stressing the inner consistency of their own tradition. Now, this Christian pressure hypothesis appears highly likely, at least for the later stage of Neoplatonic philosophy at Ammonia School. Uh, this is an example from Philoponus, but what I wish to stress here is that Philoponus' rejection of the agreement of Plato and Aristotle is not an isolated case among the cultivated Christians of his age. Most notably, it is found in several Christian authors traceable to the same Alexandrian milieu as Philoponus. The most striking example is provided by the rhetorician and polemicist Zacharias of Mytilene, also known as Zacharias Scholasticus. Belonging to the rhetoric school of Gaza in Palestine and educated as a young man in Alexandrian Beirut, where he became acquainted with the young Severus of Antioch. And if one is willing to listen to Zacharias claims, uh, Zacharias even exerted some influence on Severus early Christian education. So this is a text from Zacharias' dialogue and monus. Uh, Zacharias is an especially precious source in general. His life of Severus, originally written in Greek extant only in Syriac translation, is a fascinating talk biased description of Alexander in the final decades of the 5th century and of the struggles, including actual uprising, actual riots, uh, then taking place between pagans and Christians and involving, among other, Ammonius school. Another work by Zacharias, the Ammonius from which this quotation is taken, is in the form of a Platonic dialogue, and it is specifically devoted to the refutation of the teaching of Ammonius on the eternity and divinity of the world. In the Ammonius, Zacharias styles himself as a Socratic hero who refutes Ammonius' view, proves creation, and eventually leads the adversary to unwillingly admit his own formulation of the Christian trinity. And 
this text also passes charges against the harmonious agreement of Plato and Aristotle. So says Zacharias, the next day, when the tongue of his disciples was with him, he was just explaining another treatise by Aristotle to us, the one he wrote about the ethical virtues. And while I was learning as usual and listening eagerly to what was said, the argument about the forms came up suddenly. I was saying that Aristotle did not maintain the theory, but was rather contending with Plato about it just as with most other doctrines too. For indeed, the two men do not agree, especially as regards the most important and essential doctrines. And I had recalled what was said by the Stagirite, away with the ideas, for they are but twitting. Ammonius, however, tried to cover up the conflict. Um, so, traces of skepticism against the agreement assumption concerning Plato and Aristotle's respective views of the soul are found also in other authors initially educated in Alexandria and inter belonging to the Gaza school, like Aeneas of Gaza and his dialogue Theophastus, or linked to the uh, Gazan intellectuals, like Severus of Antioch. Soabji has already pointed out that Philoponus' arguments against the eternity of the world and for creation have an antecedent precisely in the Gazan authors. It may be added that they also provide an antecedent for Philoponus' criticism of the agreement of Plato and Aristotle. More specifically, Zacharias provides an antecedent for the, critic, for the criticism uh, concerning the issue of forms addressed against Ammonius himself. What makes this correspondence all the more intriguing is the fact that Zacharias did not only criticize Ammonius' theories on some of the main topics as Philoponus. What is more, at the same time, Zacharias in Alexandria either belonged to or was close to a group of engaged Christian laymen called philoponry, lovers of labor. Such groups existed also elsewhere in the cities of the Roman Empire and were uh, sometimes called also spodaioi, zealots. They served as helpers of the clergy in liturgy and ceremonies, and if needed, they could be mobilized as instruments of pressure, as shown by their involvement in the episodes of anti-pagan turmoil and intimidation narrated by Zacharias' life of Severus. While it cannot be taken for granted that Philoponus' nickname refers to his affiliation to the group called Philoponoi, for it also may be out from his outstanding scholarly learning, and nonetheless, the possibility appears to square well with his Alexandrian upbringing and his proximity to Zacharias' intellectual profile, which notably involved the criticism of pagan culture on their own grounds. For anybody wishing to uh, delve deep into this topic, uh, there is a very well-documented and careful reconstruction of this issue, taken up also by Sir Abji himself, uh, which is the amazing book by Edward Watts, Sitting School in Late Antiquity and Alexandria. So to sum up, my main point for this last part of the seminar is that Philoponus' rejection of the typical pagan Neoplatonic assumption of the agreement of Plato and Aristotle should be understood not as a chance, not as casual, but rather as belonging to a Christian intellectual attitude also testified by other engaged Christian intellectuals traceable to the Alexandrian media. And that would be all on my part. Thank you for listening to all of this. Thank you very much, Giovanni. That was fascinating, very fascinating and full of uh, new ideas. Uh, buzzing in a in an apparently well known uh, well known context after what's uh, what's his studies but you uh, showed us how uh, the studies the, the the path of studies uh, opened up by what's can still and should still produce new new thoughts and new reflections especially um, your new uh, i am referring to your new reflections on the universals in philoponus 
So before asking anything myself, I uh, would like to open the floor for the discussion. So if, if all of you are too shy, so I, I will try to, um, so I, I am wrong in stating that basically you are um, linking, you are trying to link uh, the, um, so, uh, the, the, the context of uh, philosophical riots uh, to, um, to Philoponus's position towards the universals, basically. So there is a very subtle shift, so to say, which is actually um, a great shift uh, as far as his, its consequences are concerned uh, in, the, in, in, in the position towards the universals uh, as regards uh, his master Ammonius um, and bottom line as regards uh, Plato's uh, conception of the universals and the impossibility of uh, um, putting it in agreement with, uh, with Aristotle and uh, Philoponus's will to christianize the universals in, in a way yes yes so uh, as, as far as philopolis ontology is concerned what i wanted to add to our current picture which was uh, uh, mainly um, outlined uh, overall by zakuba uh, is the idea that uh, we should link as the arbiter suggests to its examples, we should link Philoponus' ideas on universals to his broader theological and philosophical work. And uh, what I wanted to stress was especially the idea that his particularism does not necessarily rule out. Indeed, it seems to me that it does go hand in hand with his theory of uh, uh, causal priority of some entities, which are the demiurgicoi logoi, so the creative rational principles in the divine mind. This idea, the idea of the rational principles in divine mind is not, mm, it's not an original idea. It has a Christian tradition behind it. But Philoponus uh, apparently uh, uses it as a, Without a contradiction between uh, the idea that the universals are concepts, that there are no Platonic forms, no Platonic separate forms, mm -hmm. and uh, to this he substitutes the logo in the divine mind. However, so uh, the the picture of Philoponus particularism remains true, but I believe it is a little bit more subtle. It, it is a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, it should be integrated with a reflection on the links between uh, the logos tesusias and uh, so the discourse concerning the nature of a given thing and what is actually a logos in the divine mind because this author thinks about both concepts and who discusses the universities in patristic theology tends not to take into account the other aspect of Philoponus uh, theology. And um, I, 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 I'm not even sure that it was uh, linked in any way to Ammonius, which is a very important antecedent, and one should understand exactly what the continuity or discontinuity between Philoponus and Ammonius is, because apparently we may think that Philoponus Christianizes uh, the theory of the three states of the universal, but when one goes into the detail of the theory, mm -hmm. one finds out that Ammonius has already relocated uh, the forms in the divine mind. And this probably goes back to a platonic discussion on the reciprocal status of the paradigms uh, and the, the, the craftsmen of Plato's Timaeus. And Ammonius appears to have a position similar to Plotinus, who unifies the two things in the same entity, uh, the, the intellect. Uh, Ammonius takes up this idea, it seems to me. So it is an idea that we can understand within a pagan philosophical framework. 
to this, he even adds just once, just once in, in, a, in a little, in a tiny line of his commentary on his agogy, that these forms, he usually says aid in Greek, mm -hmm. can also be called logoi. He, he uses them appear, apparently interchangeably. He normally uses aide, but once he uses logoi, so why? Um, Philoponus consistently uses logoi. So I'm wondering whether Harmonius is now Christianizing his vocabulary by saying logoi, because you know he did have the problem of actual riots in Alexandria mm -hmm. and of a compromise with the bishop and so on. But this is all narrated by Zacharias. But on the other hand, uh, we should make sure that uh, this idea is, uh, what is the origin of this idea? So overall, Ammonius appears not so different from Philophonus. Um, the big difference I could find was the idea that God thinks individual individuals. Uh, that that is what I tried to yes, uh, yes to say. Yes. Uh, as far as uh, uh, okay, we have also a, 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 um, a yeah, question. I, I, uh, yes, there is a question in the in the chat uh, from yeah, Andrew yeah. Dirtia. Okay, yeah, I, I will address his... the question in the chat first uh, because I I that was basically my answer. And uh, okay, so, so now he writes. Uh, um, concerning the latest part, it reminds me also of Sergius of Rishina's discussion in his commentary on the organ on, on the controversy over logic being either a part, Plato, or an instrument, Aristotle, of philosophy. If I remember correctly, while most commentators find the middle way and argue for an agreement between Plato and Aristotle, Sergius only agrees with Aristotle. Logic is only an instrument. Okay. This confirms what you say about Zacharias and Philoponus being part of a larger Christian attitude. But I wonder to what extent this radical anti-Platonic position is not only an anti-Pagan critique, but is also meant to counter any accusation of Platonism raised against these Christian intellectuals themselves in the context of originism. Curious about your thoughts. Okay, uh, so uh, this is a, a really interesting question, actually. I am, I, I'm, I'm made my mind up about Sergius himself, I, I would say that um, um, it, it makes a lot of sense that this position uh, tries to uh, keep the distance from Plato. This, this, is, this um, squares with the idea uh, suggested, for instance, by Paolo Bettiolo that uh, uh, Sergius uh, um, substituted through the Dionysius, uh, so an anti, perhaps anti-originistic author uh, to Plato in, the, in his uh, architecture of the, of, let's say, theological knowledge. And uh, so, I, I believe that, um, I am not sure that this uh, the anti pagan anti sorry anti platonic position is to be linked necessarily with the issue of the logic being um, an instrument of uh, philosophy. Um, I have the impression that Sergius may belong to uh, a group of authors who. Mm, are no longer reading Plato anyway, no, not, not that much at least. Uh, that, that may be because his education was in Alexandria and Ammonius, while being a Neoplaton commentator on Aristotle, used to, uh, to, uh, to provide lessons only uh, as far as we know, uh, no, as far as we can verify on the texts. Uh, only concerning Aristotle, he seems to have a preference for Aristotle, so to say. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not able to answer on the issue of the logic as an instrument. I do believe that Sergius may have an anti-Platonic uh, um, position overall, yes. 
Uh, I'm sorry that I, my answer is not not more useful than that, but I hope I, I hope that is something. Else. So, um, is is there um, is there another question? It is I see Cody Stryker. Hello. Yes, yes I do there, is a, there is a question from Cody Stryker. Sorry, I was muted. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for the talk. <clears throat> you you mentioned at the beginning the Trinitarian theology in Philip Paulus, and I wonder if he connects at all this language of the logoi with <clears throat> the um, the logos directly, um, and what the connection possibly is uh, in his mind. Um, as as you see in in other theologians, Maximus um, does he does he make that connection directly? Do we have enough uh, of his Trinitarian theology to say? Uh, so the, the, the connection between his Trinitarian theology and uh, his Christology in the what what do you what connection are you um, well, suggesting? Yeah, so the um, you, you mentioned that he uses logoi as the term wow. for these in, in the divine mind. Okay, and you see in in other theologians, why is that term specifically used? As you said, Ammonius is Christianizing here because the logoi are connected to the logos, the son. Oh, uh, okay, yes, yes. Um, Does he make this connection? Uh, he doesn't explicitly make the connection between Logoi and the Logos as uh, the second hypothesis of the Trinity, but he certainly knows that this is a, a consolidated connection because in Christian tradition, it is uh, it is not commonplace actually, but it is rather common to find the connection. And um, uh, he, he does he never insists, at least as far as we know. Uh, on the relationship between Logoi and Logos. Uh, we are unlucky because, of course, his Trinitarian works are lost except for a few fragments because he was uh, condemned for heresy later uh, after his death. So um, we only have fragments and it is hard to, to find uh, this link. But uh, there are many authors, especially since Origen, since uh, from the time of Origen, uh, Till uh, Philoponus Age, who maintained that the Logoi, the proper place of the Logoi within the Godhead, is of course the Logos with the capital L. So uh, yes, I, I believe he, uh, he he may have conceived them that way. There's there's just another thing that I was thinking about introducing in this uh, seminar, but then I left out, which is the idea that. Um, um that even the revisited particularism that I am trying to find in Philoponus uh, uh, theology and trying to, to describe does not change the fact that it cannot be applied to the Trinity. So usually scholars see a continuity between Philoponus particularism and Philoponus theism. Because once you have no longer one common nature, but only you, you insist on particular natures, that it is a short step to becoming a theist. That is to becoming uh, someone who says that there are three particular natures of the Godhead, and uh, uh, you basically dissolve the one common nature in this way. Um, what I mean to say is that. Philoponus has an idea that the Logoi in the mind of God are prior, causally speaking. They have a causal role with respect to the individuated Logoi in the individuals, yeah, so uh, in the particular beings. But this priority cannot be accepted. The same model cannot be simply transferred to the Trinity because the one common substance of the Trinity cannot in any way be prior to the three Trinitarian hypothesis. So uh, yes, this that this is uh, an addition to the uh, to to my answer. But I just wanted to stress this. Uh, and so uh, the answer 
the straightforward answer to your question is we uh, we we cannot know unluckily to, as far as I remember what Peloponnes establishes a connection. I find it very very likely, and, uh, and so it is insightful on your part to to think of that. So uh, thank you for pointing that out. Just. Uh, Bishara. Um, thank you, Giovanni, for your uh, lecture. It was very um, insightful. And um, I have um, some, um, 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 yeah, some, some question. Or I'm wondering if uh, Philoponus uh, um, used the, 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 the idea on the three states of, the, of being from um, a Christological reflections, or he was just based on a philosophical reflections. I will explain myself. I, I think that in Miaphysite um, uh, circles, uh, already with uh, with the Severus, uh, there was the reflection on who was incarnate, the hypostasis of uh, one of the Trinity. So it was one hypothesis. So we have the uh, development of the concept of substance as some total of its hypostasis. And we find this uh, idea also to to, de to be in uh, develop uh, to to be developed also among uh, neo Chalcedonians and uh, uh, mainly with uh, John of Dam Damascus. And uh, we you you referred to the idea also by by, by the Great. So it was also uh, shared by some uh, Nestorians. Let's say it. So it was uh, a necessity uh, by those. Uh, um, theologians to understand uh, or to, to explain that just one of the Trinitarian hypostasis was united not to all human beings, but just to one body. So uh, they developed this kind of three states of, uh, of, of being. So my question is, uh, we can put also Philoponus in this kind of reflection or, uh, or, or he was like, uh, in, uh, he started from a philosophical uh, uh, yeah, reflections or not. Okay, uh, well, it seems to me that he was uh, placed in this kind of reflection, for instance, by, uh, by Zakube. He's not considered, of course, a new Chalcedonian or anything, but uh, the idea that he develops the notion of particular nature uh, responds to, uh, to, to, that doesn't uh, this innovation is developed by Philoponus uh, for, for this reason apparently because that is the uh, the reason why he introduces it. It is a Christological reason. Then it may be applied to the Trinity perhaps, um, but the, the idea is very clear and it is very clear that he has in mind the problem that only one hypostasis of the Trinity. Uh, has become incarnate because he makes examples to this effect. It, he also makes a Trinitarian uh, example, but uh, even when he's not referring to the Trinity in the Arbiter, he says, uh, if I remember correctly, that uh, uh, he stresses that each uh, living being has its own share, its own portion of nature. So this is what makes it possible that when another one dies or suffers, this the same does not happen to all the other individuals of the species, and this is, of course, this must be a, a reference, uh, a stressing the conceptual point of uh, the Christological debate. Uh, so yes, I, I agree. Uh, I do believe that this is the main reason why he develops his, his idea. I, I can't account for uh, Babe, for instance. Uh, I, I believe Philoponus uh, reasons in these terms. I am not sure about Babe, uh, but I found it so interesting that he has a similar conceptual framework and even a very similar example. So I had to 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 show you. Um, are there any other questions or remarks? Because if not, I have uh, some very disorganized, unorganized um, thoughts um, concerning also my usual Dionysius. Um, because what you uh, what you what you were showing about Philoponus uh, also seems to be shared at least one generation earlier by 
by uh, the, the, this, this kind of, of concern, I mean, by Dionysius, who uh, in the fifth chapter of the uh, divine names uh, stresses how forms uh, are not at all uh, independent beings, but uh, independent substances, but um, also only causal logoi in God's mind. And this is uh, this is one ontological point uh, stressed by Dionysius in basically the whole of that chapter of the divine names, uh, which concludes is concluded by a veiled polemic against Proclus. And then uh, in the first chapter or in the second, I don't remember. I think it's the first when the question is asked. Uh, then all the Trinity uh, is um, is. Contained in every name, he says that yes, in a sense it is, because uh, the universal, he doesn't use this language, of course, is transferred as a whole in every cause that it, in every effect that it causes. So I, I, I think, well, there is, there is no uh, reflection, I, I think, in Dionysius on the intermediate state of the universals, so to say, but uh, on an intermediate imminent state of the universals. But uh, it seems to be um, to be a similar concern that moves him to uh... yes, uh, yes, and this is very interesting. I I, I left out the Dionysus from from this uh, discussion today, but it is very interesting because uh, well, of course, he also has a philosophical background. Just like Philoponus, although he's older than him. And the interesting fact is that he does uh, refer to the same example as Ammonius uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, the seal of the ring or the pattern of the ring being impressed several times. He uses mm -hmm. this comparison. He uses the same comparison. And uh, time, this yes. is a, a very widespread comparison. Since we mentioned Sergius of Alshina, Sergius too has it in his categories commentary, both to Philotus and to Theodore. And uh, several later commentators have it, for example, uh, Elias and David. But the, the thing that singles Dionysus out, that makes him unique, is the fact that soon after using this comparison, he does something no, no one else does, if I remember the text correctly. Mm -hmm. He also specifies one very interesting thing, the notion of platonic participation being according to different degrees. Yes. Well, yes. well that, why does he do that soon after his comparison? Because he probably has in mind an originistic view which he wishes to eject. So if one accepts the comparison of Ammonius and is aware of its ontological underpinnings, what we have is the idea that the one seal of the ring, that is the one uh, logos or form, anyway, the one prior element in the causal chain, which is impressed on several individuals. Well, does this happen in the same way for all the individuals? If so, this may assemble a situation where God produces uh, uh, um, uh, in, in separate intelligences which are all alike at the beginning. Yes, like so in it makes a lot the of origin is pathology. Yes, it makes a, a lot of sense that he decides to add here a genuinely neoplatonic idea, that is the idea of participation, which is not granted to everybody to the same degree, but he adds it and he alone, if I, uh, if I remember well, perhaps Simplicius has a similar uh, reference saying that you can see the form in the piece of box better or worse according to, to, the, uh, to the fact that it depends on the, or on the quality of matter where it is in past. Um, <laughs> yes, so Dionysus has a different concern and a similar background, ontological background, or at least a, a similar idea at his disposal, and it would be interesting to compare him close, closely, more closely than was done before, not only to the Athenian scholars of his age, but also to uh, the Alexandrian philosophers. And, uh, which we, we only, which we always say. <laughs> But uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this was in part, uh, I, I, 
I, I, I wanted to, to, to prompt this reaction because it, it is in, sort, in part a reply to Adrian Pirte's um, last yeah. question, the last part yes. of this question, that isn't yes, this anti-Platonic in a, in, a, in a way uh, attitude, so also an, an auto-apology in, uh, in, in a context of originism, in the, in the, um, or an attack to originism even. I am convinced, for example, that in the case of Dionysius, it is. Uh, for Philoponus, it wasn't so, um, so urgent, perhaps. But here comes another question from me. Isn't this um, difference, which is called analogy by analogia, but by, by Dionysius, in degrees of participation in the same whole universal, not so different from the particularized share of the particular nature in uh, in, in Philoponus. Yes, I believe it is similar because uh, what I wanted to stress is that while, for instance, Zakube says, uh, while Philoponus is splitting up, is dividing, is making into pieces the one common nature with his idea, with this new theory of particular particularized nature, what I wanted to say is precisely perhaps there is a near platonic kind of pinning to this idea. So, uh, as I said, I, I believe the examples do not suggest that there is such a division because we are not dealing with uh, pieces of wood. We are dealing with the participation in the same nature. So, um, I don't know if I made myself clear, but the, the idea is uh, mm, we can't. Uh, we should think that Philoponus mind, the Philoponus has in mind uh, incorporeal beings and all that this entails in Neoplatonism. So uh, it is something way more similar to Plotinus' theory of how the soul can be one and many at the same time than the idea of a piece of, of, of I don't know, a nature like a piece of wood which is chopped up into as many parts as we wish. Uh, and by the way, Philo, uh, sorry, by the way, Plotinus in Enneads 4 9 uses himself speaking of the soul, the same example of the ring and the seal in past several times. So this is the, the, the background. And in Philoponus' case, we are sure, given his uh, philosophical education, that he was fully aware of the background. Not only because he refuted Proclus, but also because while refuting Proclus, he quotes Plotinus a lot, for instance. So uh, we can be sure about his um, um, full understanding of the implications. Otherwise, I would say perhaps he was not fully aware of what uh, fully aware of what was entailed by his examples. But he does know; he perfectly knows. Mm -hmm. That's why it's very interesting to me. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Are, are there, uh, that's so fascinating. Are there any other uh, questions, curiosities, remarks, comments? So if this is not the case, I would like to thank you very much once again, although it is really, it is always a bit surreal to, um, leave a guest and just and just truncate the, the the conversation as it happens with zoom but uh thanks thank you again very much for animating this very fascinating lecture thank you, thank you all for, for listening and for discussing and for the thank new you. ideas you threw in today thank you Thank you very, very much again. Uh, we'll be meeting again with this PLOS uh, lectures in uh, January, on the 25th of January with Benedetta Contin on Armenian ontology uh, as applied to Christology. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you all for attending and have a good holiday time, you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.